<laughs> it's, a, it's, it's one of those learning for the sake of learning things. What? <laughs> no, no, for for real. Uh, thank you for thank you for coming. This is you know, when I was invited to do this. I tried to hide from it, and, and um, so Diaz made a big deal about it, posting everything on Facebook and sending out emails, and until I finally just capitulated and gave in. My topic is the uses and the misuses of the discipline of history. So I want to start by talking about my dad. My dad's bad advice to me. As a freshman at Texas Tech University uh, back in 1990-something, I am starting off my very first history course, and I've noticed that the professor has not listed a textbook as part of the syllabus. Cool. <laughs> Excellent, you know, anything, you know, less reading for me, that's what I'm thinking, right? And I go tell my dad, who's paying the bills at the time, I got no book for history, what do you think of that? And he says, what do you mean no book for history? Didn't put it on the syllabus, what can I do? Don't have to read anything. My dad says, all right, look, go to that university bookstore, go get a history textbook, a world history textbook, I don't care which one. I said, really, what, you don't care which one, like it doesn't matter? No, after all, you're not going to change history, right? I said, yeah, of course not. I mean, it's all stuff in the past, and you know, someone was there writing it down, and they put it in a book, and now we have to read that stuff. <laughs> you're not going to change history. Well, let me suggest to you that history, the events, the sayings, the wars, the treaties, and the other deeds of the past do not change. They happened after all. Nobody can change that without a time machine. But the telling of history changes. Our perspective on history changes. How we see the past and interpret the past changes. Our memories reflect our experiences, our own personal stories, and our biases. The Greek philosopher Plato said that we see through a glass darkly. We see things only in part. We only see things through our own limited perspective, through the lens of our experience. Let me ask you, does a veteran soldier view, por view foreign policy and foreign wars with the same perspective as a armchair CNN viewer? <laughs> Certainly not. Does a parent view changes in school policy different from one who is childless? Do the poor view things differently than the wealthy? Do people of color view things differently than white people? Yes, I would suggest yes. <coughs> our experiences and our places in the world do affect how we construct meaning. So when my kids come in for the first day of history, one of my, my favorite experiments to do is to start with a little bit of a, an experiment. Right? They don't know me, I don't know them, but uh, I, like to, I like to stage a spectacle for them. I like to, uh, to, to really shake things up. So when I'm doing something very ordinary, like I'm taking attendance or I'm going through the syllabus or something, I have a principal appear at the door with a very stern and forbidding look on his or her face, as if principals look any different. <laughs> I have this, uh, last year I had Miss Anders do it. So can you imagine Miss Anders coming to my door and, Mr. Gillespie, I really need to talk to you. And uh, this is all staged, keep in mind. Well, can you hold on, I'm doing this, or I'm taking attendance, or I'm doing important things. Mr. Gillespie, I, this is very important. You really messed up this time, Gillespie. And now the kids in the class, oh, cool. <laughs> Anders, I'll tell you another thing. I mean, poor Anders is not here, but she, she, she would remember this. Right? I, Anders, I'll tell you, I'm running class now. I can't be bothered by this stuff. And then we really let the show happen. I told you, Gillespie, attendance at 10 o'clock, not 10.06. This is the most incompetent teacher we have here, Gillespie. And then I shout something back, and we do this exchange, and finally I end up by throwing something on the floor. Great theater. <laughs> Finally, Anders takes off, and I say to the kids, okay, yes, you're right, 
Uh, you probably caught on by now. That was a staged event. That was a spectacle. That was something for your enjoyment. But what I'd like everybody to do, I say to the, to the kids, is uh, get out a piece of paper and something to write with. And I'd like everybody to write a history of the last five minutes. And, oh, well, how hard is this? OK, so they sit down and they write for a minute or two minutes. And then I say, OK, we're going to share our histories. Because what you have done is you have just created a primary source document that may be of great value to historians in the future. We don't know. Historians may want to look back on this day and this, and this scenario, and they want to know what formed your opinions about something, and they might want to know. So let's, let's look at these, at these 25 to 35 histories that you have just written down. Um, now, some of our historians out there who have been doing this, this exercise, some of these uh, 16, 17-year-old historians included my name. Some just said the teacher. <laughs> some of them included that this was Miss Anders who came in and yelled at me for something. Some of them said some lady <laughs> or a principal. Some of our little historians recorded the room number or indicated that they, they were in Atascacita High School. Some of them thought to include the time, the day, and the date. Hardly anyone has ever thought to add the context. What were we studying? What class were we in? What was the topic of our conversation that day? And so even with 20 or 30 different accounts out there of what had just happened, there are still holes, gaps, inconsistencies, and problems with our history of the last five minutes. And then there's other problems, too. What about the kid that I wrote up freshman year for texting in the hallway or something, and he ended up in my class? What kind of a bias goes into his history? I mean, he might write that Anders was completely justified, and I, and I am the most incompetent teacher on campus, right? <laughs> But then there's the kid whose sisters and brothers have had me through the years, and they kind of like me for whatever reason, and they write down, oh, man, Mr. Gillespie was really, really, uh, you know, this, this is an injustice toward the greatest teacher out there. <laughs> well, how, how are we going to know to believe? How is, are these accounts going to be free of bias? They're not. Now, if a historian of a future time were to want to reconstruct that last five minutes, he or she would really have a gold mine of information. 20 to 30 independent written sources on a single event is way more than most historians ever have to work with. Yet with such wealth of material, there's still going to be gaps and inconsistencies, contradictions, and yes, perspective differences. Now think about history. Not of the last five minutes, but the history of centuries spread across continents and experienced by varieties of human beings and all sorts of varieties of social situations and varieties of wealth and varieties of power. A history of the United States, as brief of a time as we have occupied on this planet, is extraordinarily complicated. Think of the perspectives, biases, point of view references that the historian must encounter, rich, poor, white, black, Hispanic, free and enslaved, male and female, gay and straight, and so on, whose story should take center stage when we write history? Is your story, your perspective of greater value than mine? Shall we take the perspective of those of us with money or those of us who do not? Shall we take the perspective of those of us who have education to a certain degree, or those of us who do not? Which is valid? Which is reliable? What choices do we make? Well, one of the exciting uh, projects that I got to do, when, and I had great, great fun with this in my graduate studies at the University of St. Thomas, involved an investigation and an analysis of textbooks published by the Confederate States of America during the American Civil War. I reviewed over 40 different textbooks published between 1861 and 1865. 
the years that the southern part of our country seceded from the northern half of the country and declared themselves an independent agricultural republic. And you see, one of the things that the Confederacy really